Oh, good, and they didn't talk sometimes. You guys should be able to see there's a chat you can talk in on. You guys. Title. I'll give people like five minutes to like join up. <laughs> Shifter, what's up, dude? I have some of the other students here that are going to interact with this. They're not exactly taking AP. They're here. What's up, Shifter? How's your Saturday going? Easy. He's a topic. Go live. All right, we're live on that. Nice. Up. Cool. I probably can't. Oh, I can. Oh, sick. Oh, this is. Okay, cool. Yes. Okay. And so I don't know how many, how familiar you guys are with Discord, but um, if you ever want to like talk or whatnot, there's a thing called like raise your hand or whatnot, and that'll bring you up to the stage and then you can just ask any questions and whatnot. This is supposed to be kind of more of like a, you know, back and forth. I'm not just going to lecture. I'm here to help you with what you specifically need help with. So if certain topics here are just like super easy and you're like, oh, I get that. That's basic. Like we don't need it anymore. Like let's go over the harder stuff that, that you guys need help with. Um, turn this up. A little bit, a little bit more. Test, test. <sighs> All right. What's up, Alexandria? You found us through TikTok too, right? Yeah, that's where you originally found us, I remember. Let's see, what, what day is this exam? It's next week, I know. Is it Thursday? Is it Thursday for you guys? AP 1 exam day. It is. It is Thursday. Okay, so we still have some time. Yeah, okay. These are all the, all the exams they have. Oh, this is cool. Uh, oh, so calculus is tomorrow. Uh-oh. Is anyone taking calculus? Anyone else taking calculus tomorrow? You will be. Okay, cool. All right, awesome. A, B, or B, C? Which one are you doing, Alexandra? A, B. Okay, so that's so you don't have to do, like, series and limits and whatnot. That, that's the nice thing about that one. Um, cool, they have... Yes, here you go. You guys like the last one, physics one, algebra-based. In the afternoon. At least, at least it's not in the morning. That would suck if you had to do it in the, or in the morning. Like, I don't know. My brain doesn't really work in the morning. <laughs> it takes a couple hours for me to wake up. So, uh, then there's physics too. Limits is, and continuity is the most you get into. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, and they have all, I guess, all the, the liberal arts ones, I guess, are more of the first week. Yeah, art history, macroeconomics, history. Okay, cool. All right. Let's, um,. Good. I'm streaming there. I'm streaming there. Streaming on Discord. Streaming everywhere. <laughs> Good. All right, let's start off. All right. Welcome, everyone, to a special edition of Office Hours. My name is Dr. Gold. I'm here to help you guys out with the AP Physics 1 exam coming up. 
Um, big shout out to I think Dan Burns is is probably the reason you guys are here. He's a he's a very well renowned guy within the the AP Physics community, and he emailed a bunch. We did this last year. We had a him. He just sent out a bunch of emails to a lot of teachers, and they uh, told you guys about these these free tools we're we're providing for for you guys to do well on your your exam coming up. Um, the main uh, tool that I, I I see some of you guys have already found it so far. Uh, are these review questions we have here on uh, Kudu, which is uh, a company I also work for. They uh, try to create more cost-effective textbook solutions. Not as much of a problem for you guys right now in high school, but when you get to um, college, textbooks get very pricey, and it's for like the wrong reasons, so uh, this company tries to help you guys out by making uh, more, more content available for cheaper. So anyways, we have this AP Physics 1 review course. If you haven't found it yet, there's directions uh, inside the Discord uh, forum group here that has how you can add it. And this just has a bunch of questions in all different types of sections. Okay, so if, for instance, you're like, okay, I already know work and energy, but I, I need more help with rotational dynamics, you can click on this section, and we have these cool videos uh, that give like a, a big like review if you guys want to watch. It's like a YouTube quick review. There's a... A PDF here that has a bunch of um, kind of like quick overview lecture notes that you can read. And then when you go here into the questions, these are all AP physics type questions that um, a lot of experts have written. And we've transcribed them to put them here on this, on this platform for you guys. So you can come in and just uh, go through. These are like multiple choice questions that you can try to answer yourself. And you, you have as many tries as you want. And a lot of these, I think, yeah, we have we have solutions built into them too. So if you ever want to know why, uh, there is there there are solutions built into them. So we have explanations for everything as well. Also, if you ever have questions about certain particular topics or certain AP questions, you can always um, ask these in the Discord. So we have that within. Um, here we go. Oh, Discord. Oh, here we go. So within this this like Discord forum. There are a bunch of threads here, and you can just you can always just you can create a new post if you want. You can just be like, you know, hey, Doctor Gold, I like I I I don't get uh, Atwood machines or something, you know, and that will pop up, and I'm happy to just answer it, and I'll give you guys whatever you know help you guys need to. So, super useful. A um, little background about myself: I have a PhD in plasma physics from UCLA. Uh, I've been working uh, in the education sector for about almost a decade now. I did a lot of this uh, during concurrently with my PhD and a big passion of mine is, is, is helping, you know, education be accessible to all, regardless of like income. Um, so I run a nonprofit to actual education. Uh, this is our discord and we help students all the time. Uh, three times a week, we have a stream on Twitch that you can, you can join. It's free and you can ask any sort of math or science question and I'll go over it. Um, and uh, yeah, and the other thing that, that that we do is if you guys like to you know interact with other aspects of the Discord, please go around. Uh, there's lots of friendly people here. You know, if you're looking for like a fun little community, we pl I play video games with with these kids all the time. So that, that's kind of my uh, my uh, my introduction into to getting people hyped up about science. Okay, all right. S spring overview would be great to focus on. Okay, cool. I like that. So we already have you know, Alexander's already said like, yo, can we can we like just like focus maybe on the springs? I'm totally down with that. Let's let's see let's see. Um, my my general plan for how I usually do these things is that the free response section is usually what trips people up the most, and it's what the most amount of uh, points are. On, okay, and what what we like to do is run through these FRQ sections, but not just like do the solutions, but show you why. The solutions work and certain strategies I have for how to how to get through things. Okay, um, again, if you ever have any questions or you 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 you're like, hey, hold up, I don't get that. Throw it in either the chat here on Discord. You can throw it also on the chat on this on. Um, <laughs> it says I hate the the MCQ. It says I I scored forty two. Okay, forty two out of what? What's forty two out of who? Uh, and then you can also you can type in the ch in the Twitch. Oh, it's 42 out of 50. Oh. oh, okay. The exam has changed since I took it. I, I took this exam probably 15 years ago, honestly. But the physics hasn't. <laughs> you know, the physics stays the same. Um, 
which chat am I looking at? I have a lot of chats. So we have Discord, we got Twitch, and then I also have TikTok. So there's a lot of chats going on. I'll try to answer all of them, but, you know, uh, hang in with me here. Okay. So here's the, the FRQ section. Um, these are the, the tables that you guys get. These are useful. Uh, it's very nice, actually, that they give you all the trig identities. I thought, like, this usually you have to kind of know or they, they assume you know. So this is, this is nice that they give this to you. They tell you the symbols. Constants are nice. And then all the Greek prefixes. Yeah, this, it, they're kind of nice with you guys. All right, cool. All right. Oh, one second. I need to disable this. Awesome. All right, and then we have some equations. Um, yeah, the unit circle helps, but yeah, it's nice you can refer to the table. This big mess, <laughs> like, it's just like, it's a huge equation sheet. I remember when I took AP Physics, my teacher actually made a t-shirt where it had this table on the t-shirt, and we were always allowed to wear that t-shirt to any of our physics tests that we took. Um, but it was like upside down so that you could like look down at it and you could see what the equations were. <laughs> Um, this is cool. I mean, this will help you and whatnot, but it's a timed exam. So if you're, if you're spending all your time trying to look up, um, the, the, uh, the different equations where they are, you're going to, you're going to waste time. Uh, okay. One second. What is the site called here? Uh, we have it streaming on discord and Twitch. Let me give them the link real quick. Discord.actual.education and Twitch. Actual. Our, our websites. Uh, yes, this is, yeah, this is to show people, yeah, I'm helping out the AP physics students. Okay. Anyways, equation sheets. Okay, cool. All right, first question. We got springs. We got springs. Uh, Alexandria, here we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to walk through these and like, kind of like show some strategies and tips I have for when I do them and how you can, uh, yeah, you know, use those to also do well on, on questions. Okay, so we say two blocks are connected by a spring that passes over pulley as shown above, below. Block one is on a horizontal surface and is attached to a spring. Uh-oh. We got springs and pulleys and Atwood machines. And let me guess, is there is there going to be friction? Uh, okay, frictional forces are ne negligible. Nice, I like that. that that's going to make our life a little bit easier. And it says block two is, yeah, thank goodness. Yeah. Block two is released from rest and moves downwards before momentarily coming to rest. Yeah, this is an important thing. Frictional forces being negligible is nice because that tells me I can use conservation of energy and I don't have to deal with like the energy loss to friction. Uh, that starts becoming kind of a pain in the, in the but all good. Um, yes. Okay, cool. All right. So. Um, blah, 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 blah. Here's all the, the constants that we're allowed to use. These means, you know, th these are the, the variables we're allowed to have in our final equations. And then they're asking, okay, here, and then let me put this over so I can, no. I just want to see both of them. Okay. All right. It says block two starts initially from rest and speeds up and then it slows down and momentarily comes to rest at a position below its initial position. <laughs> Lots of words here. In terms of only the forces directly on block two, explain why block two initially speeds up and explain why it slows down to a momentary stop. Okay, they're talking about this one, right? It's kind of a cool, cool concept. Um, and they say, in terms of only the forces exerted on block two. So this, this is a good, a good, a good thing to uh, go through, which is, yeah, they love the conservation. What are the forces on block two? Now, when we have stuff like this, it's very tempting to try to think of the other forces that are acting. So some people will be like, oh, I think the spring force is acting on this. And it's like, nope, not exactly. It is indirectly, but we only won't care about the direct forces on block two. Okay. Yes, good. Exactly. Yes. So we have the gravitational force, which is going to point down. That's going to be FG, which is going to be right equal M2G. And then we're going to have the tension. Very good. We're going to have the, well, let me draw a straight tension line. We're going to have the tension that's pulling straight up, okay? And this is going to equal to something, right? There's, there's, this is where we have to then solve for tension using mass one. Um, okay. But they ask, okay, why does block two initially speed up and then why does it slow down to a momentary stop, right? Okay. 
Um, so what we know, right, is that initially when this is at rest, this block is going to want to fall. So because gravity is going to be pulling it down. And as, as that happens, right, this thing is going to accelerate. So it's going to like speed up in the downwards direction. And as that keeps happening, we're also going to have this spring starting to stretch because as this block moves down, this block moves to the right. I like to always kind of like draw an arrow. I, maybe you guys have seen this before. I call this like the, um, like the movement arrow because I want I wanted, because up down movement for block two technically correlates to left, right movement for block one. Uh, they don't give us a K. I think they just give us K naught is what we're allowed to use. We'll see. We're going to use stuff with, with the variables later. But the reason why I do this is because I'm going to define a, a, a positive and a negative direction for everything. In this case, I'm going to call this positive. I'm going to call this negative. So going down is positive. Going up is negative. That seems kind of backwards, right? But there's a reason for this. Because when I look at block one, I want to describe going to the right as positive and going to the left as negative. So now whenever we do like our sums of forces and whatnot, we're going to have the correct signs for things because the pluses and minuses can get really difficult sometimes to like keep track of. Um, the key thing here is that any movement here up down is going to correspond to the same movement left, right. So in this case, any a y we have, okay, is going to be the same thing as any acceleration in the x direction that we have here. Okay, These are, these are going to equal each other. Okay, all right. So the reason why this thing accelerates downwards is because of gravity. But as it starts to go down more and more, this spring starts to stretch. And as the spring is going to start to stretch, so let's say like mass one is over here, and now the spring has stretched a lot, okay, it's going to exert a force on mass one, which is going to be trying to pull it back, okay? Because we know from Hooke's law, right, that F is equal to negative K delta X. So if this thing is stretching in the delta x direction to the right, then the, the negative k, the force is going to pull it to the left. And any force pulling here to the left is then going to also be show up in the tension between these two uh, blocks. And so that's going to cause this to also be pulled upwards, which eventually that force is going to cancel out the force of gravity pulling it down. And it, it'll slow down. Um, and we can figure out what that value is going to be. Let's see where they, where they have it. Okay, so that's what I would say would be the explanation for it. Let's see, they probably have the, the solutions that they write too. It's always good to kind of see. Uh, ba -ba -ba. They say. Yep, 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 yep. Right, yeah. And yeah, they, they, they say a key thing here in the solutions is that you have to make sure you're not saying that the spring force is exerting on block two. That's not right. The spring force exerts on block one. And then because of that, you're going to have a tension that is going to pull um, to the left and slow down block two. Okay. Um, derive an expression for the distance delta y that block two travels before momentarily come. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, exactly. Derive an expression for the distance delta y that the block two travels before momentarily coming to rest express in terms of all these constants. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So let's, let's see. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Okay. This, I think we're going we're gonna to want to end up using conservation of energy. Okay. Uh, because, and, and my, my whole reason for doing this is anytime I see things that are like moving up and down and I see springs that are stretching left and right, I know that these have energies associated with them, okay? And this is where it, it helps to know in your equation sheet uh, what the energies are. So, for instance, we know the, the energy of a spring, which uh, I guess U.S. is kind of what you get. Do you guys use that? U.S., U energy of a spring? That's equal to one-half kx squared. Yeah, good. And then we have the energy due to gravity. Oh, let's make my S's not look like G's. <laughs> That's equal to mgh, right? And then we also have... Um, the, the kinetic energy, which is equal to one-half mv squared. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the total energy before, and then we're going to look at the total energy after. Okay. 
Now, before, right, that's in the beginning, we say that this thing starts at rest, okay? Which means the velocities of everything are zero, right? And if the velocities of everything are zero, that means our kinetic energy is going to be equal to zero. So the energy we have to do in each situation, we have to add up all the kinetic energies, all the spring energies, and all the gravitational uh, potential energies uh, for all the objects at a certain time. So before, everything is at rest, so we don't need to de deal with kinetic energy. And also afterwards, w when we say it's come back to rest, the kinetic energy is also zero because everything's at rest. Okay? So we don't really care about kinetic energy. Don't got to deal with it. Okay. Um, let's look at the energy before in terms of the spring energy. Okay. So before, the spring is not stretched, so that means the spring energy is also equal to zero. Okay. So here we have Ke. This is, this is going to be equal to zero. We don't have anything with it. The spring is initially unstretched, okay? So mu s is also going to be equal to zero, right? Um, and then we're going to have to deal with the, uh, what is it? The gravitational potential energy. And this gets tricky sometimes because people start saying like, wait a minute, like, like where is H? They're like, you know, what am I supposed to do here, <laughs> right? Because uh, I don't know how high this table is. Well, the cool thing about gravitational potential energy is you can call any reference point equal to zero. Exactly, delta y. Yeah, you're going to get Alexandria. Yeah, perfect. So you don't need to ever um, know exactly what the absolute height is. You really just need to know what the change in the height is. So in this case, I'm going to end up calling this position right here. I'm going to call this h is equal to zero because... That for me, I, now I don't got to deal with this, like I don't have to deal with any MGH for this block because the height is always zero as it moves left to the right. And we're going to assume um, that mass two starts, you know, at, at some value. Let's assume that it basically starts at zero here. And then all we have to deal with, right, is delta Y, which is going to be, it's, it's going to be a negative height. Okay. So here uh, I'm going to say that the potential energy here is also... Uh, due to gravity, that, that potential energy is also equal to zero. Okay, so mu gravity is also equal to zero. Okay, goes away. So <laughs> all of this is zero, which is kind of nice. That makes things nice, okay. Okay, but the energy afterwards is going to be different, okay. So afterwards, right, kinetic energy is also equal to zero um, because uh, everything's at rest, okay. So Ke is also going to be equal to zero. We don't need to deal with that. Goodbye. Uh, the gravitation, the spring energy though is going is to change because now the spring will have stretched, okay? So as the block, as block one moves to the right and block one and block two moves down, this spring is stretching. And the cool thing here is the amount that it stretches by is the same as delta y because they're all connected to each other. So the amount that this goes up down is also the amount that this goes left right. So when looking at the spring potential energy, which is going to be one half kx squared, I can just say, okay, cool. This is one half k delta y squared. Does everyone, uh, does everyone understand that? Like why, like the the spring stretches by delta y because the other block moves down by delta y. That might be, yeah, it might be kind of tricky. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and then we, we get... Yes, displacement cha is change in y. Yes, exa exactly, Alexandra. Yeah, because, okay, this is spring energy, which, okay, so this one is zero. But this, right, is usually, spring, spring energy is usually one half kx squared. And what we're saying is the amount that the spring stretches as it goes from here to here is the same amount that mass two drops. So in this case, x is going to be equal to delta y. So here, my spring energy is going to be 1 half k, k0, I guess that's the variable we're allowed to use. And then we're going to say delta y squared, right? Now, uh, the next thing we have is going to be um, the gravitational potential energy, which, again, this, we're going to assume this still stays, you know, at height equals 0. However, our other block here, right, mass 2, is going to drop, right? It's going to go down. It's like, woo! Goodbye, block two. So the potential energy there is going to be equal to um, plus M2G. And now the new height is going to be a negative delta Y. It's important here that you put the negative because it is dropping in height. It is below what we're saying is zero. Okay, So this is going to be negative 
uh, delta y. Okay. Awesome. All right. So now, all, all, what are we solving for here? I always gotta like forget. Like, what are we? What are we solving for? We okay. We want to know delta y is what we want to know. Okay. Cool. All right. Um. Okay. So I have this equation here, which I can now simplify. So this is going to be zero is equal to one half k zero delta y squared minus m two g delta y. Let's move this over to the right. Okay. So. Oh, come here. Yeah. So now these equal each other. And we can cancel out factor. Yeah, you could factor. I'm also I so this is a dangerous thing to do this. This is like, you know, warning. I'm just gonna I'm gonna just gonna divide out the delta y. That's what I'm gonna do. And that's gonna kill out one of these. Uh be careful when you do this because you need to make sure that this would not be equal to zero. Because technically uh, we're getting rid of that solution because if z this is zero and this is zero, then this is correct. Like, you know, uh, yeah. zero equals zero. But yeah, we, we don't, we're, delta y being zero is what we call a trivial solution. We don't really care about it. Trivial means like, you know, it, it doesn't really tell me anything. Okay, awesome. So now I can solve for delta y here, right? And so this just, uh, you know, multiply both sides by two, divide by k zero. And I get that delta y is equal to two m2g over k0 and let's see is that the answer they get oh yes it is nice okay good we got the first thing right <laughs> cool yes everyone on tiktok welcome you know if you guys you want any help with uh studying for ap physics one i'm going through the free response questions i'm gonna do it for probably the next hour or two so i'm gonna get some help uh you can always join our discord uh using the link it's discord.actual.application there it is. You guys want to talk live with me? You can talk on the chat there too, but Discord's quicker. Okay. It says, indicate whether the... Okay. Indicate whether the total mechanical energy of the block's spring earth system changes as block two uh, goes downwards. So this is, this is important. And honestly, I used to screw this up too a lot when I was y'all's age. Uh, it's like, what is mechanical energy, right? So... <laughs> I used to think that mechanical energy was just kinetic, <laughs> but it's not. Mechanical energy refers to all of basically the energies that are like conservative. So it, it refers to, yes, total, exactly. So total mechanical, th this mechanical part like tends to screw up students sometimes. Really, they should just say the total energy. And this is kind of a, a Newton's law type thing, uh, you know, or, you know, energy can't be created or destroyed. So the total energy is not going to change because, and, and that's what we used here. One example of not mechanical energy, I think it's friction. Like friction is not a mechanical energy because it's not conservative. Like, and what they mean by like conservative forces, not whether it's like a Democrat or, or you know, Republican who cares about that. But what, what they care about is that could you get the energy back by like doing it in the reverse direction? So in terms of a spring, if I stretch a spring, the spring will go back. So the energy kind of can go back and forth. Friction, unfortunately, you know, like if, if you start losing energy due to heat, due to friction, yes, good thermal loss, you can't get it back. You can't convert that thermal energy back into not friction, you know, so that's that's what they talk about. Okay, cool. All right. That's that. Okay, that's part A, part B. We're good there. Okay. And then let's see what do they want for part C. Oh, wow. They love these graphs. <laughs> Consider a system that just includes the spring, earth, both blocks, and the string. Oh, the spring, earth, both blocks, and the string, but not the surface. Let the initial state be the blocks here at rest just before they start moving. Let the final state be when the blocks first momentarily come to rest. <laughs> Diagram A is a bar chart that represents the... the whatever. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, cool. Complete diagram B for a scenario in which friction is non-negligible. Non Ooh, this is cool. I like this. Yeah, this is good. Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Good, okay, all right. Yeah, I know, there's a lot of words here, right? <laughs> I'm just like, yo, chill on the words, college board. <laughs> also, chill on those registration fees, please. Wait, what? It's like, was it, like 60 bucks, like, to send your scores to a school or something? Dude, stop. Um, okay. All right. 
this is what we did before, right? This was total energy. See how we had spring energy, gravitational potential. So in this case, they they referred to this being like some some height zero. It's okay. And they're saying that this does have like potential energy that's positive, and then it drops to have Oh, you know what's interesting? They're calling this, they're calling this H equals zero. Which is okay. You can still do that. So that when this when this system starts, there's potential energy in, in both of these 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 uh both of these things. Um Okay. Yes. Uh uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. I don't I don't really agree with this because are, are they not considering the 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 gravitational potential energy of block 1? <laughs> because if if they're saying that afterwards there is zero gravitational potential energy, right? That means that we're calling this point where like block 2 falls to here, we're calling that zero. But technically this would still have gravitational potential energy. Yeah. Yeah, they only give one square free descent. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, here here here's what happens. So This I I don't agree with this. I think this is technically wrong, but it's it's okay. So b basically what they're saying is that all of our gravitational energy is getting converted into spring energy, and that's correct, okay? Um in reality, I I would have uh I would still have this up a certain amount. And then, you know, cuz technically block 1 still has gravitational potential energy. But let's assume it is ha how they have it. Um, okay. The key, the key thing here is to know, like, what is the total energy of the system? Yeah, I think the wording only refers to M2 then, but... But see how it says for the blocks Earth system? It technically refers to all of them. So, yeah, that's why this is, like, this is worded poorly, honestly. Um, because if you're going to call block one as having zero gravitational potential energy where it is, block two technically has gravitational potential energy. It, it's all about, like, where you reference things. Um, it's, you know, College Board makes mistakes too sometimes, I guess. Um, but the, the key concept here is that here we have a total energy equal to four. And yeah, ZD, you, you had it right here. Is that if we, if we, if we have friction, friction will actually start stealing some of the total energy. So we need to make sure our final here that the total energy does not add up to more than four or does not, it has to add up to something less than four. Okay. That's probably what they're looking for. <laughs> Um, yes. So, uh, what's going to happen is if there's friction now, as this thing moves, you know, to the right and whatnot, not all of this, um, chain, not all this drop in potential energy is going to go into all of the spring energy. Some of it is going to go into being lost into heat or thermal friction, which means that our spring energy is not going to bounce up as high. So, you know, for me, I'd put like something like here, for instance. Okay. And then also, the block two is not going to drop as as much, okay? Because um, because some of, some of that energy that that would be be putting into the spring energy is now also being lost. So this, you know, I would, I would maybe end up putting this as well here. Let's I'll put this at at like two, for instance, and then I would put this at like one, for instance. Is what I would say because I, I I don't want them to add up to four. They need to add up to something less than four. Quantum, aware of existing. Yeah, well, this is not quantum, thankfully. This was quantum. This get tricky. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. So, again, the spring energy is still going to be positive. We're still going to dump energy into the spring because it, it is going to stretch. It's just not going to stretch as much because gravity... Uh, because friction is going to steal some of that energy. And also, the gravitational potential energy is not going to drop as much because... Um, some of that energy will also be lost to friction. That's the, that's the, yeah, that's, that's the reason why. Interesting. That's a, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't, again, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with this. I, I, I don't like it. <laughs> but nobody's perfect. Any quantum stuff planned? Uh, not today. <laughs> if you want to ask about quantum physics, you always can, uh, during our, our office hour streams on, 
Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This is a special stream I'm doing where for um, the uh, AP Physics 1 students. But yeah, that's my, that's my regular streaming schedule during the week. For You can ask anything. You can ask quantum questions. You know, I, I, I teach quantum. Um, they did not specify uh, their reference point. You're right. You're, you're very right, SD. You're right. XD, XD Viz. Yeah, Viz, you're right. They didn't, right? Uh, so their reference point to me must be something like, it must be something like here or, or, or something. I, I'm trying to like actually think what their reference point would be. How could you have a reference point such that the, the gravitational potential energy for both of these things adds up to zero uh, at the end, right? I guess you would, have, you would have to call this like H equals zero such that the negative H here cancels out the positive H here from block one. I think that's what they would have to do. Uh, that was a seven-point F4Q. It was a seven-pointer. Yeah. Okay. This is the 12-pointer. Okay, 25 minutes. So how long should have that one... That one should have taken 13 minutes. That's quite fast, honestly, to go through it. Um, okay, that's why it's, 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 uh, it's useful to do the practice ones. Uh, and this is why it's useful to not be looking up equations all the time. You should know right off the top of your head that, like... Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Spring energy is one half kx squared, and then gravitational is mgh. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's look at question two we have here. Okay. All right. Two identical moons. Moon A, and Moon B, both orbit a planet. The mass of each moon is significant, but less than the mass of the planet. Okay. Cool. So this is mp. We know this is going to be uh, M0, M0, and they're aligned as follows. Okay, cool. And then they want me to know, okay, represent the two moons. On each dot, draw and label the forces exerted on moon A and exerted on, on moon B. Cool. All right. So we got to look at the different moons and see what the forces are going to be. All right. So... This is uh, gravitational forces, which we know F is equal to big G, M1, M2, all over R squared, where these are um, what we call like the pairs of masses. So moon A, for instance, yeah, for, yeah, free body diagrams are easy if you've managed not to overthink them. I agree. The problem is like, yeah, some people, especially when, when you guys start doing these ones, you know when like they have this and like they're... they're they're pulling the block on the bottom, and then there's also the block on the top. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Like, which one is this? Which one is this? Right? These, these always, like, confuse students, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also when you, have, when you have these, when you have, like, like, three blocks and you're pushing on a force, you have to be very careful to know, like, what's F1 on two? What's F2 on one? What's three on two, two on three? I can do one of these later, too, if you guys want. This is, this is a, a common one that tends to trip students up. Uh, yeah, awesome, Biz, yeah. Yes, good. Yeah, so on Moon A, yeah, you're right, very right, Viz, yeah. So Moon A is going to feel gravitational forces from both Moon B and from the planet, okay? So Moon A is going to have what we're going to say, this is going to be like F, B on A, and then it's also going to have the force of the planet on A, okay? So it has two, two sets of forces that are acting on it. And then Moon B, right, is going to have the force of the planet also pulling it in this direction. It's going to be more, right, than... Uh, F, FPA because it's closer but then moon A is going to pull moon B to the left okay so yeah good we're going to have this and then so this is going to be here this is going to be F FAB and the cool thing here is that this force will be equal to this force yeah okay cool da 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 dum. okay that's great okay cool agree with that all right uh, let's see, part B. Calculate the net gravitational force exerted on each moon due to the planet and the other moon. Justify the, why the magnitude of the net force on moon A could be larger than the magnitude of the net force on moon B. Okay, cool. All right, so this is where we have the expressions for things, okay? So FBA, which is the same thing as FAB, is going to equal big G, that's the big gravitational constant, and that's going to be um, the mass of A, the mass of B, but they're the same. They're both M0. So I can just say this is M0 squared. And then the distance between the two, this is cool. The distance between these two is going to be this RA minus RB. That's what this is. They're kind of, they try to trick you here. So this is going to be RA minus uh, RB squared. Okay. And then uh, the force between the planets. Okay. So for instance, FPA 
That's going to equal to G, uh, M0. Did they tell me the mass of planet? Oh, MP. Good. MP. That's going to be RA squared. And then this is going to be F force PB is going to equal to G, uh, M0, MP over R. Oh, yo, thanks for the follow. Awesome. RB squared. Good. All right. So now we just, you know, just plug in for values. Okay. So, um, let's see, do they want it? They want to do, oh, thanks for the follow as well, dude. <laughs> Good boy, please. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. Um, burr, burr, burr. okay. They want the sum of the forces. And then what direction are we going to put this in? Let's, let's put this over to the, let's put this to the right. Okay. Um, I'm going to call this direction positive. I'm going to call this direction negative. Okay. So the sum of the forces on moon A, that's going to be this. Plus uh, this. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. My bad. Plus this one. Ow. Copy, please. Thank you. There we go. Okay, cool. Whereas for the sum of forces on uh, moon B, okay, be a little bit different. That's going to be uh, AB is now going to be negative because it's pointing it's pointing to the left. So the forces in between the A the A moon and the B moon, those are going to be negative. So we're going to put that over here. I'm going to put a minus sign on it, and then it's going to be plus the force for RB. Okay, cool. All right, so these are the expressions. We could simplify these. Um, I could factor some things out. You see, I have a G in all these cases, right? G and G. So we could pull a G out. I can also pull an M0 out. Um, so let's see. Some of the forces on A, if I pull the G and the M0, this is like style points. I don't know like how much you actually have to do. This would be equal to... Uh, and then here, let's, let's make this one first so I can compare it. So that's going to be MP over RA squared, okay, minus M0 uh, over RA minus RB. Squared, okay. And then, or I say plus, sorry. And then the sum of the forces on B is going to equal to G M0. Um, and then that's going to be MP over RB squared plus or minus M0 over RA minus RB squared. Okay, good. All right, awesome. Okay, cool. That's done. Um, and now they want us to know, justify why the magnitude of the net force exerted on M could be bigger than the force on B. Okay, so they're saying like, why, how could this value, for instance, be bigger than this value? And they say just the magnitude. Yes, good. All right, yeah. No, no, you're totally good. Why are we subtracting one, adding for the other? Okay, so on moon A, right, the, the gravitational force between the moons pulls to the right, and the gravitational force between A and the planet also pulls to the right. That's why both of these are pointing in the positive direction, and that's why I'm going to add them. Okay. Whereas for moon B, okay, planet gravitational force still pulls to the right. That's FPB is what I said. But then the gravitational force between A and B, A is going to pull B to the left, okay? So this one is now going to be a negative force, okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, I actually see the awesome dude. Uh, yes, good. R squared, yes, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's why B has the minus. A, A is just positives. Um, okay, and the other thing we know, right, is that RA has to be greater than RB, right? RA has to be greater than RB. Because A has to be further to the left than B. Um, so let's see. So these terms are going to end up being the same, okay? But one's plus, one's minus. And they want to know why A could be larger. Well, I mean, right off the bat, right? Um, let's see. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Okay. We can, you, you can do this as, a, as an inequality if, if you want. You know, this is, this is kind of cool. Um, let me see what they what they put down. For justification, what do they say? For they just say because it adds and it subtracts. Well, that's kind of a lame response. <laughs> I mean, 
Yes, these do add, and yes, these do subtract. So yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. But this has a larger denominator, right? So this technically could be smaller. Um. Uh. Right. So, but I guess okay. Nah. Well. Eh. See, that's kind of eh, college board. No, no. No, no. College board. <laughs> I, I don't like that. That's not a good explanation. Uh. Okay. You can compare these two things to each other. We're trying to prove, I guess, that like F B is greater. Sorry, it's less than FA, right? That's that's what we would want to show. This is how I would show it, like, rigorously, okay? So if I take this whole expression and I say, sorry, this whole expression, and I say it's less than this one, okay? So let's just, let's just, let's just, just humor me here so I can, I can show you guys. Because I want to show you, like, why. Because it actually depends, kind of, on, on some things. All right, if I make this as an inequality, this is an algebra question to solve, Okay. Uh, I can just immediately just start get, get getting rid of s similar terms, right? <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Okay, cool. We don't need these anymore. Okay. Uh, bum, 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 bum. This, you see how this is minus and this is plus, okay? So I could add this to the right, okay? And then I could subtract this to the left, okay? So this would be MP over R, uh, RB squared minus mp over ra squared is less than, and then this is 2 m0 ra minus rb squared, okay? Um, and then what do we know? We know a is greater than b. Okay, cool. Rules of one. So a, a is always great, ra is always greater than rb. Right? So this is definitely going to be positive. Uh, because this is going to be a smaller number than this. But then I have to show that, like, that this number could be bigger. Um, and when that would happen. Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. One sec. I see something cool here. So I have an MP on both of these. So I'm going to have MP... And then this is 1 minus RB squared minus 1 over RA squared, which is the same thing as RA squared minus... So if I make these common denominators, RA squared over RA squared, RB squared. Because there, there's a certain condition for this, for, in order for this to be true. Um, this becomes... RA squared minus RB squared all over... R A squared times R B squared is less than two M zero, uh, and then this is R A minus R B squared, which here we can put this. We can put the mass of the planet over here, right? Because this is cool. This you this you 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 start seeing that this actually depends on a couple things here. Like there are a couple things that need to be true in order for uh, the magnitude to be. Um, yeah. So what happens here? Okay. That in order for this statement to tr be true, I need the radius, I need the distance between moon A and moon B to be pretty small, okay? If, if RA is basically equal to RB, okay, then this just goes to zero, which is nice. So, what I would, I would go down and show that and, and say that, okay, if this distance, right, if RA is the same as RB, basically if these two moons are, are very close to each other, um then um, then you will have the magnitude of the forces on B being less than the magnitude of the forces on A. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, it relates to the mass of, right, the mass of the planets. Uh, sorry, the mass of the moons and the masses of the planets. Because um, if the mass of the moons get, like, very big, <laughs> right, then, then this becomes a big number. Um, but yeah, if the mass of the planet becomes very big, then this becomes a very small number. Then it's harder. Uh, let's see. What do they put down? They say... For indicating the force vectors on moon A point in the same direction, and there, therefore the magnitudes add, while the force vectors on moon B point in opposite directions, and then the magnitudes are subtracted. That's a very basic answer, but okay. Cool. I mean, yes, this is more rigorous. Which one do you have to do? Eh, no. I guess you can get away with just saying that, like, <laughs> one of them adds one of them. Okay, justify why the magnitude of the net force on, Mar on, on moon B could be larger than the magnitude of the net force on moon A. Okay. 
um, derive an expression for, for, for both of the following quantities. Oh, and then they want, um, oh, okay. Oh, so we've already, we've already kind of done this. Okay. All right. So, yes. So you could also have the sum of the forces on A, so the sum of forces on B being larger than the sum of the forces on A. If, for instance, um, if the mass of the planet is very big is what it is. If the mass of the planet is very big, then this becomes very small, and then the opposite happens. And so you have an opposite direction of the forces. Th yeah, this one's a little bit more complicated, but um, it, comes, it, come, it comes down to this, right? These are, and, and this is actually what part C is. Part C, they say derive expressions for, for the forces, the net force on A, and then the net force on B. We've already done that. So that's, that's what we did right here. This was the net force on A. This was the net force on B. Um... We show that A can be greater than B because this is adding forces instead of subtracting. And then in order to show that this could be greater than this, okay, what could happen is RB could be very small, okay? If RB is small, dividing by a small number makes this a very big number, okay? Um, let's say, let's, and this is a great thing. We, we love to do this in physics. We, we call this like, like, um, like l limiting, um, what's this called? Limiting cases. So let's say, so let's say, R B goes to basically zero. So let's say, for instance, that that Moon B is like like right here. Okay. In that case, right, these things would go away. Okay. So I would be just adding here, subtracting here, whatever. But this would get huge, because if I divide this by a very small number, like basically zero, right, this becomes infinity. And in this case, the forces on uh, Moon B become a lot, a lot bigger than the f some of the forces on Moon 1. You can see that conceptually, right? Um, because if we move this Moon B like very close to here, let's say Moon B is here, then because this force goes as 1 over R squared, this force is going to be pulling it so much stronger than the planet is, is pulling on Moon A. And also Moon B will be very far away from Moon A, so it won't really feel the back force pulling it back, and Moon A won't really feel any force pulling it towards the right. That's conceptually where it comes from. Kind of a tricky one. Yeah. <laughs> Reminding me of ind indeterminates. I know, it all comes back. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Definitely a, a trickier one, depending how much time you have left, you know, in your exam. Depends, like, how rigorous you'd need to go in order to get into this. Um, I think you're fine just saying conceptually, you know. In one case, the forces add. In one case, they subtract. So this can be greater. Yay. But in the case where moon B is very close to, to the planet, then this blows up. Like, this gets huge. And this doesn't change, right? I mean, well, this does change a little bit because, like, as this goes down, actually, this the sum of the forces goes down because now the gravitational force between Moon A and Moon B is 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 less because they're further away. So that's a that's a case where this one could be. Great. Yeah, cool. One was a little tricky, a little bit tricky. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I would mention a hypothetical case when they say justify, right? When they say when they say here, they say justify why. I would say, okay, think of the case in which, you know, Moon B is, uh, you know, very, very close to, to, the, to the planet. Moon B would feel a lot more of the force. Uh, in the case where Moon B is very close to, to Moon A, okay, right? In that case, um, Moon B feels a force to the left, and, the, and, the, and they... So here's actually the cool thing. This, this is cool. Let's say that, like... A was here, and then, like, B was, like, right, right, yeah, whatever. I'll be, I'll be, we'll call it square planet. This will be square planet B, okay? And let's say they're very close to each other, but they're both located very far, right, from the planet, okay? In this case, the forces in between these two things would be huge, 
because the forces in between those, right, is one over like a minus b squared, right? And if these are basically on top of each other, then their distance is very small, so they're going to feel very strong forces. A will feel a very strong force this way. B will feel a very strong force this way. And then in terms of the planet force, because they're basically right next to each other, they basically feel the same planet force. So in both cases, they're going to feel basically the same force of the planet. This will be the same. Because remember, the force of the planet uh, only depends really on the, the distance of A and B to the planet because it's 1 over R A squared or... So the R of the planets would some... Yeah, the difference in R would be somewhat, somewhat be negligible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So because R A... If R A basically equals R B, then the, the planet force acting on both of these is basically the same. And it's, and it's pulling it to the right. However, the forces in between the, it, sorry, the forces in between the moons becomes very, very big. And for B, it points, it pulls it to the left. A, it points it to the right. And so in the case of A, the, the force of the moons pulls it to the right and the force of the planet pulls it to the right. So they add. In the case of B, the force of the moon pulls it to the left. Force of planet pulls it to the right. So it's got to be less. Like plus plus has to be less than plus minus. Cool. All right, that was a that was a, a involved one. Okay. Could the expression? Yes. Oh, okay. We we just we just talked about this. Yeah. Right. So this is the case where like moon be <laughs> close to to planet. <laughs> so we say like R B basically equals zero, and then this is moon. A and moon B the same. So when R A is equal to R B. Wow, physics. Yeah, right? You know what's kind of cool? Like, we, so this is actually interesting. Um, in doing these explanations and whatnot, we answered part D and C already, like, as we were doing it. And that's actually a very, very cool, handy thing. Is that if you can kind of already see the path, uh, like, I'll be honest, I haven't seen any of these questions before. I'm literally looking at the at them for the first time because I want to give like an accurate um, way of how I would attack them if I saw them like you on a test for the first time. And you can see that if we if we have the train of thought of like, oh, let me see why, let me see why, let me see why, you're going to be answering questions they're asking anyways. So it's, it's uh, physics is, this is why physics is, physics is pretty uh, because it's not really teaching how to memorize, you know, where's the cytoplasm or where's the Golgi apparatus like or... What's polymerase? Um, it's learning a process. If you learn the process of how to solve things, you'll it'll you'll fall right into like what they want you to do. It, and that's basically what happened here. Is <laughs> we we answered all the questions they wanted. We just did it right at the beginning because uh, we kind of guessed what they were gonna ask. Okay, cool. Ooh, ew. <laughs> just like oh no. <laughs> Uh, let's see. What's happening here? Okay. A wheel is mounted on a horizontal, uh, axle. A light string is attached to the rim, wrapped around it several times. Oh, I fucking love this text, man. Small block. Okay. Yeah, rotation. I know. Rotation can be scary sometimes. It's okay. Two students are discovering how different forms of energy change as the block falls. One student says that the kinetic energy of the falls is... Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, this is, oh, I love these questions where they're like, hey, if you were to do an experiment, how would you do it? Yeah, design an experimental procedure. This is, this is always like, they didn't have these questions when I took the AP exam. We didn't have like design an experiment. We're like, what? <laughs> um, okay. Could use to compare the increase in the block's translational energy with a decrease in the gravitational potential of the earth block system as the block fall. Okay, so here's what's happening. They're dropping this block, and they want to see if the change in the kinetic energy of the block um, is equal to the change in the potential energy due to gravity, which I believe you're also going to lose, you're also going to lose energy into what's called, like, rotational energy, because uh, the wheel is not massless. I hope it's not massless. Right. Well, the string is light, but yeah, the wheel is definitely has mass. So, um, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Measure. So 
in order to do this, right, if, if we want to measure the potential energy, that's MGH, right, I need to know mass and I need to know, I need to know the height, okay? And if I want to measure kinetic energy, right, that's going to equal to one half mv squared. Yeah, correct. Very good. Very good, Viz. The, the, only, the only problem here, Viz, is that we also have rotational kinetic energy, right? So there is the translational energy of one half mv squared, but there also is going to be rotational kinetic energy, which is equal to one half i omega squared. You also have to consider, uh, yes, linear versus, versus angular. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the, the, these are linear things, okay? However, when you spin something, you also need to put energy into the angular. Um, yeah, exactly. So this this person's like, oh, I think it's just these two things that are related, which like, no, <laughs> you, you she's going to, or he or whatever, uh, they is going to forget this. They're, you know, they're also going to forget that, that you have angular uh, energy that's also being uh, here. So quantity you measured, I don't know, here, mass, that would be M. Equipment for measurement, that's a scale. Uh, velocity, ooh, oh, here, velocity of block, right? Uh, V, or, yeah. Uh, technically we don't measure, we don't measure the velocity. We measure the position. So let's just say like position. So position and time is what you need, right? So this would be X, T. This you could measure with a photo gate, I think is what you could. Yeah, photo gate, time measure, the stopwatch or your iPhone. Uh, and I think that's all you need because then you can derive the velocity from the position and the time. Let's look real quick. Yeah, M, G, you already know G. H you can get right from the, yeah, from the photo gate or something. All right, let's see what they put. He's saying college board. Uh, yep, good. They have mass, distance, time. <laughs> they use a meter stick? <laughs> What what is this, dude? What like is this like the fourteenth century, dude? No, we use a photo gate, but okay, cool. Uh, you could also use a meter stick <laughs> if you want. These days, you guys have cameras. You can just hook an iPhone up and then just like just have it like take pictures, which is like super cool. Um, yeah. And then what would you do? So I would hold it right. I'd put the meter stick. I'd let go of it, and I'd record what the position is at different times. You know, um. Yeah, probably in writing out the step, steps. Explain how could determine the kinetic energy of the block immediately before it reaches the floor using the quantities. Okay, so you could get the kinetic energy from one half mv squared, right? Where v would be equal to the change in position on the meter stick divided by the change in the time. Pretty basic. This honestly should be like a gimme part of the... Of the um, of the part, yeah. Uh, oh, this is another cool thing they say. <laughs> um, you could calculate the final energy from the average velocity. Oh, uh, okay, that's cool. Actually, I, I, I do like that. That's kind of a... Well, KE is going to start at zero, right, Alexandria? Because it's going to start at rest. Photogate measures time, doesn't it? Yeah, motion sensor. Yeah, you also have to explain the procedure. I know. I, yes. I feel like that's self-explanatory. You let me know if it's not. I, I can explain it if you need. But uh, a lot of writing. Uh, Photogate does measure time. It does. Uh, you, usually what happens is, for instance, the string would, would have like markers on it. And, um, well, actually, no. You know what I'm thinking of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of the one where like you have something like this. You drop it through. Yes, and the photo gate just measures like the distance from here to here. Um, so actually, yeah, a photo gate probably wouldn't be the best idea for that. You're right. You're right, Viz. <laughs> yeah. Let's use LIDAR. We'll use like a LIDAR sensor. LIDAR sensor. LIDAR can measure the position of something. <laughs> uh, but here's a cool solution they also say. So if you ever want to find V final, right, that's going to equal to twice times V initial. And the reason for that being, right, do you, do you guys remember this equation? Like, uh, or sorry, twice times V average is what I meant to say. So V final minus uh, plus V initial all over two is equal to V average. Uh, and then from this, right, I can see that VF is equal to two V 
the average minus VI, but VI is zero. So the final velocity is twice times the average. Okay. Um, and then the average is equal to the total distance divided by the total time. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus, not minus, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do minus. Yeah. Only when it's starting from rest, exactly, yeah. This this wouldn't work because then you wouldn't know what the initial velocity is, you know. The cool thing here is that you only have to measure measure distance and time. You just drop the thing and you say, oh, how far did it fall? How much time did it take? Now I don't have to use any sort of, um, you know, LIDAR situation whatnot. I literally just have the, the starting and the ending time. That's pretty cool. Okay, I like that. That's cool. Okay. The graph represents both the change in the gravitational potential energy of the earth block wheel system and the translational kinetic energy gained by the block as a function of distance on the graph. Draw a line of curve that represents the rotational kinetic energy of the wheel as a function of the distance. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So what we know is that... <laughs> line of best fit? Yeah, yeah, I know. What we know here, right, is that the total energy needs to be uh, the same. Right, so the kinetic energy that that the that this so see how energy here starts at zero because it starts at rest, right? When we get to here, energy also needs to be zero, the total energy. Okay, and this is good. This is what that we I, I was talking about this right that um, the rotational kinetic energy. This was the one half i omega squared that they're going to miss. Okay, so what I know is that at the end, okay, this total energy needs to also be the same. Okay. So if this is like point, you know, what does that look? That looks like point, point one five, right? Then I need another, um, <sighs> need another, was another point two five, right? Such that the energy here gained the kinetic energy of it falling faster, plus the energy in the wheel spinning faster. That needs to add up to the same energy that's lost. Uh, well, not lost, but gained in kinetic energy going down, which is, it's negative. Because 1 FMV squared is, yeah, it's pointing down. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, this is MGH. My bad, sorry. This is MGH. This is 1 half MV squared. Good. And then this, here, this, like, green line right here. This is going to equal the 1 half I omega squared. Okay? So what's happening is... As this thing falls, right, MGH is dropping, okay? Because remember, total energy is going to equal MGH plus one-half MV squared plus one-half I omega squared. So as this drops, these two things need to go up in order for the total energy to stay as being zero. Does that, does that make sense? That's, that's kind of a, that's, that's a, that's a very key concept that you need. Mm -hmm. Okay. And since the total energy starts at zero, I need the total energy at the end, like when the thing has fallen down, to also be zero. So I need this negative gravitational potential energy to be equal to the sum of the positive gains in kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Then you're in kinetic. Okay, the students also measure the angular velocity of the wheel as the block falls and determine the rotational kinetic energy of the wheel. They make a graph as follows. Draw a straight line that best represents the data. Okay, um, I don't know. I like this. That, look, that looks kind of okay, right? Well, it should pass through zero. <laughs> okay, we're going to say something like that. Okay, using... The data you drew for part D, calculate the experimental value for the rotational inertia of the wheel. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, a little tricky here, but not too bad. Okay. Um, 
we know that the kinetic energy for rotation, um, so let's say like K omega, I guess, okay. Or, oh, that, that's KR, they say KR. Okay. That's equal to one half I omega squared, okay? See here, I would be lost. It's okay. So here, let's, let's, let's see how to not be lost, all right? Graph one half I. Yeah, 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 exactly. So this is a graph here, Alexandria, of K versus omega squared. This is the kinetic energy of rotation, which we know, KR, is equal to one half I omega squared. Okay? So... In this graph, again, we're graphing y versus x, and we're getting a line, okay? So if I have y versus x and it's a line, it probably looks something like this, right? So you have y equals mx plus b. b is the y-intercept, which here, this is zero, so we can just get rid of this, okay? So it's just y equals mx. y, in this case, is kr, okay? That's what we're graphing on the y-axis. x, in this case, is omega squared, okay? Because that's what we're graphing on the x-axis, all right? Now, this m then, okay, this is going to be all of this right here. Yeah, Viz got it right. You got it. Yeah, right here, dude. Right here, okay? So this tells me that m, which is equal to the slope, is going to equal to one-half i, okay? That's the way to do it. And I can calculate the slope of this graph, uh, well... Ugly. So ugly. <laughs> uh, okay, slope. Let's remember, that's change in y over change in x. So, let's, let's find a nice point. I'm going to find, like, this point. I don't know. I'm going to say, like, we're going to go from 0, zero, zero to... Uh, what is that? It's 5, so that's 30, 30, 31, comma 1. Okay? So, change in y is 1... Change in x, right, is 30, 31. So here, let's just pull out our calculator. You get a calculator on this part? I forget if you do. You? <laughs> Good. Yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Times two. Yeah. This is 1 over 31, which is this, right? Good. And then I'm going to multiply it by, by, by 2, right? Because it's 1 half i is the slope. So i is equal to 2 times the slope, which, yeah, is going to equal around uh, 0.06. And then this is important, the units, okay? So let's remember, this was in joules, right? So it's y over x. So it's joules over radians per second squared. So it's, it's 0 0.06 joules. Uh, joules per second squared over radians squared is the units. Um, which I guess you can also, this, this translates to better units. Since YKR is supposed to be around 0.18. What do you mean by that, Viz? What do you mean? YKR is supposed to be point. Um, the, the other way I can figure out units is that, um, so I, I know inertia, right? So let's say for a point mass is MR squared, right? Where this is kilograms, right? And then this is meter squared. Okay. So the units for this is also going to be uh, a kilogram times a meter. Easier way to do it. Okay. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Since YKR is supposed to be around. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're talking about how the, the residuals are supposed to be the same viz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my straight fit line is like, it's, you know, it's, you know. You are right. You are right. That uh, in order for this to be a better, like, line of best fit, I don't know, maybe it would technically be this. It's It's so... A hefty, a hefty, you know, so it's like it's it's it's, it's close. Yeah, uh, and the reason for that viz is yeah, a best fit line is 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 the least squares regression. It's not the no, it's not the same number of points above and below the line. It's the same magnitude of the points above and below. This is called the residuals. Like 
if I have a point like way up, way up here, th that's going to be worth a couple points down here. Because what you actually really end up doing, it's the least squares, it's, it's the squares of the residuals as well. That's a more, don't worry about that. That's a very nitpicky, like finicky. Yeah, it's very finicky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is stats. If you want to go into stats, you, you don't need to. Yeah, no, it's okay, Viz. Yeah, no, you're totally right. I'm just saying that, like, if, if you have, like, one line, one point here, which is, like, way the fuck off the, your best fit line, then you need a lot more of, lot, you need a lot more points below it <laughs> to, to, to pull it in the right direction. Um, but if you don't have any outliers and they're generally aligned with each other, you're very right, Viz. Yes, you should have approximately the same number of points above and below the line. Is it going to make that much of a difference here? No. So, you know, it's okay. We're good. Nice. All right. Question four. Oh, we got, oh, we got five. Okay, so we only got, we only got two more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, if you want to learn more about that, Viz, yeah, it, it's called least squares regression. And this is a, look this up. This is a cool, like, stats thing. And here, I can, I can show it to you actually. Quick. Kind of cool. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Yeah. It has, it has to do with this. It's the sum of, like, <laughs> the differences of, of the residuals is what it is. There's, there's, a whole, there's a whole equation for it. Yeah. Uh, and then well, there's something with, like, the residuals. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. These are the residuals. And like what you're basically trying to do is you're trying to minimize the sum of all the residuals. Um, because if, if, if a line fits very well to the data, then the difference between the data points and the line, the sum of all those differences, the residuals will be less. Wow, lots of trees planted. That's cool, man. Oh, uh, yeah. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right, Alexander. Okay. All right. Uh, a student has a piece of clay and a rubber sphere, both the same mass. Both objects are thrown horizontally at the same identical blocks that are rest on the edge of the identical tables as shown where friction between the blocks and tables negligible. After the collision, both blocks fall to the floor. Okay. In case A, block A sticks. In case B, the rubber sphere bounces off rather than afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. In the in the figure to the left here. Okay. Um, I think they're they're gonna have us graph like what what the uh, the what the different different momentums are. Okay. Um. The momentum of the sphere walk system after the collision in case B. If the momentum is zero, right is zero. If the momentum is not a zero, it must be an error. Okay. Okay. All right. Important thing. We have two different types of collisions here. Okay. We have one where this is going to end up um, sticking to block A, and we have one here where it bounces off. These are two different types of collisions. What are they? Elastic and inelastic. Yes, good. All right. Key things to know. Elastic, inelastic, okay. This is what I call, like, sticky. <laughs> Stick. These are, like, bouncy. So, excuse me. Forgive my, like, fourth grade words for things. <laughs> Uh, in both cases, momentum is, momentum is always conserved. Momentum, always conserved. Okay. However, in elastic e e collisions, which are, are w what we say is perfectly elastic. Okay. We have that kinetic energy is also conserved. Here, uh, kinetic energy is not. There's another term, which is like perfectly inelastic. I've heard this before. And I'm like, what does it mean that something's like perfectly inelastic? Like, it's either, like, it's, it's, it's either elastic or it's not, you know, right? Oh, Calc and Physics, thanks for the share, dude. Appreciate. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, we have two situations. One where the clay sticks to block A, and one where the, the rubber sphere bounces off block B. Um, but in both cases, momentum needs to always be conserved, Okay. So in case A here, they're saying, oh, this is, my, this is my momentum after the collision of the clay and the block. 
Well, that means the momentum of the collision before the clay in the block had to also be equal to this, okay? And in case B, right, if, K if case B has the... Okay, they say they're the same mass and they're thrown at the same speed, right? Rem re remember that momentum really only cares about um, uh, mass and velocity. Mass times velocity, okay. So if these both things have the same mass and they have the same velocity, okay, then they have the same starting momentum, okay? Max kinetic energy is lost in perfect inelastic. Okay, cool. Good to know. The maximum kinetic energy. So you lose all of it? Maybe you lose all of it. That's what perfectly inelastic. Um, but anyways, in this case, because momentum is conserved, this is going to have the same momentum afterwards. Case B will have the same momentum afterwards as case A. Because both of them started with the same momentum, and momentum is always conserved. Okay? Okay, after the clay and block A collide, block A lands a horizontal distance away from the edge of the table. Does block B land on the floor at a horizontal distance greater than or less than or equal to DA in a clear, concise paragraph paragraph length response? What? I can write a whole paragraph to what? Excuse me. <laughs> uh, yeah, they hate us, dude. What? <laughs> this isn't an English test. What? Well, I'm making you write essays. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Okay, so we have case A, which is um, that A, A is the clay, right? A is the clay. Okay, so clay, <laughs> right? Whereas in case B, right, we have a uh, bouncy, bouncy ball. And this is now moving this way. Okay. They wish for every conceivable thought process, I swear, dude. It says immediately after. Does it m not mean it switches directions? I believe it does switch directions. Um, so when they say in case B, are you talking about like the, the rubber sphere bouncing off? The rubber sphere does switch directions, I believe. Because it says it bounces off block B. I think that's, that's correct. Um, so what's going to happen here? So... So what they're asking is that when these two things hit, right, we have this 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 block which is going to be moving to the right in both cases, okay? But they want to know which one which one travels further, okay? All right. Um So, um let me let me see. I I think case B is going to move further further. Let me let me check. Yes, okay, good. Exactly. Okay. So let's remember, they, they start with the same momentum, which means they end with the same momentum, okay? Now, if we look at the, the calculation of the momentum here, let's call this like, uh, let's call this like li little m, and this is little m, okay? The momentum here, right, is going to equal to little m plus big M times V final, right, for case A. In case B, right, because they're, they're stuck together and they're both moving. Uh, no, there is uh, kinetic energy loss matters here. You don't even have to go into kinetic energy. I'll show you. You don't, you really, you don't even have to go into kinetic energy. Um, we can just look at the momentum because the momentum here, right, is going to be minus M times, I would say, the, the velocity of the, the bouncy block, right? Uh, v is positive in this case. I, I, I know, I'm just going to say it's, it's to the left, okay. Uh, plus M, and then this is going to be the V final of B, okay? But these two things have to equal each other, okay? So in this case, right, the total momentum has to equal the total momentum here. But both of the masses, right, um, are going at some velocity. <laughs> In this case, the bouncy thing is moving to the left, so it's like taking away momentum, which means this is going to have to be more. So here, if we expand this out, this is M, you know, BFA plus big M BFA, okay? This is, has to equal to negative M B of the bouncy ball, right? Plus M BFB, okay? Both, and let's just say, for instance, that this equals 10, 
and right, <laughs> and this equals 10, okay? So in this case, what? This could be like three and seven, right? But because this is going to be negative, this is gonna end up being something like negative three, so this would have to be like 13. So what we say is that block B will have to have more, more, and more velocity right after the collision because it needs more momentum to counteract the negative momentum from the bouncy ball bouncing the other direction. If I were to explain it using the momentum impulse theorem, are you talking about uh, M delta V is equal to F delta T? Is that what you wanted to say? Uh, let's think. Well, I don't know the time of the collision, though, so I, I don't think you'd want to use this one, Viz. Ex explain to me how would you use this, because, like, I guess delta T is small here, right, because it bounces, whereas delta T is probably bigger. You're talking about the, the collision time, because this probably, like, morphs into it and whatnot. Would they have the same force? You're right, they would have the same force. I have to assume, you have to assume the collision time. Yeah. Did I say that? Let me see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Well, I mean, something bouncing off of something is always going to be less time than... Okay, but... <coughs> um... Yeah, don't don't use the more time means less force to do the inverse proportion. Correct. Yes. And then um right. The problem is that like delta v is then chain oh, oh oh I see what you're saying. You're saying delta t delta v is on the the big block. Yes. Okay. Yes, they should be the same force cuz it is it's the same object acting on it. Uh-huh. Yeah, this would work. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> yes, less force means less, less acceleration, hence, hence velocity, right? Yeah, right, this is MA. You're right. Yeah, you could use it that way. I would, I think they probably want this way, Viz, though. They, they want you to talk about how, like, in, since the total momentums are the same, in this case, both momentums add up. Here you have one adding and one subtracting. This one's going to have to be bigger than this one. They love the conservation. Yeah. No, that's a unique way, Viz. That's cool. It's a unique explanation. I think it would it would it would definitely it would confuse them a little bit. <laughs> All right, let's see. Last one. Okay. Uh the spring of an unknown spring constant is attached to a ceiling. A lightweight hanger is attached to the lower end of the spring and a motion sensor. Okay, good, good, good. A 0.5 kilogram object is Placed on the hanger. This is 0.5. Yay, we love springs. See Alexandria, we're gonna do all the springs. <laughs> uh okay, cool. The spring is then stretched downwards a distance d0 and released at time t equals zero. The motion sensor records the height of the bottom of the hanger as a function of time. The output is shown on a graph. So I guess is this equilibrium? Yeah, this is yes, yeah, okay. This is equal. Ooh, yay. It oscillates. We love this. Okay. Use the information given to calculate the spring constant. Uh-huh. Yeah, this one's cool, actually. Um, the equation I always remember is that anytime you have a spring, so this is called simple harmonic motion, is what this is, and anytime you have a spring that's moving, like, oscillating up and down and whatnot, it's going to do so at, an, have, at, at like, a, a frequency, F, okay? And what we know is that omega, for instance, is equal to 2 pi f. This is frequency, right? Uh, and then the key thing that I, I always like to know is that omega for any sort of like simple harmonic oscillation is equal to the square root of k over m. Should, you should really know this one. Let's see, do they give that one to you on the equation sheet? Uh... Do they? I don't think they do. Where is it? Oh, they do. They do it here. Oh, they, they do the period, which, yeah, that's cool. That's a, I mean, they do give it to you. Um, 
Yeah, I'll show you how I, I always get it because because I always remember this right, and then omega is two pi f, that's equal to square root of k over m, and then uh, f frequency is one over period, so I can rewrite this as two pi over t is equal to square root of k over m. So then flippy flippy, okay, I get t is equal to two pi square root of m over k, which I think is probably what they that's probably what they give. Yeah, two pi squared of m over k. Yeah, that works. This is just like in terms of like in all my my years of teaching physics, like this is the one we always remember this, and then we always remember this, and then we always remember this, and then everything else can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, we know the mass, right? The mass was what? It was point point five kilograms, right? Uh, and so we just need to figure out the period of this, and the period is the time it takes to go from uh, one part of the oscillation to the same part of the oscillation, okay? Now, the key, key thing here is it's, it's from the same part of the oscillation but also going in the same direction because sometimes students will be like, oh, look, it's a zero and a zero. And, like, that's wrong. Don't do that. Because here this is zero going down and this is zero going up, so these are not the same, okay? In that case, you want, like, this position and this position this and and this this position see how this is zero going up zero going up these are the same that one's okay uh but i'm gonna try to find something where like they're on nice values i feel like it's on a nice value here and it's on a nice value here so i'm gonna say that the period here is gonna be uh equal to 1.25 seconds right is equal to 2 pi square root the mass is 0.05 and then we're going to solve for k, okay? So that's 1.25 over 2 pi uh, squared and then divided by 0 0.05 and then to the minus 1. <laughs> I just did a bunch of algebra. Uh, could you use the maxes? Yes. You could also use the maxes. Because this looks like, uh, what is this, like point, point 0.6 to like 1.8, you know? Same, same, same thing, about 1.25. Yeah, you can use any of them. You can use this pair if you want, you know? I just, I like things when, like, they, they seem to be, like, hit, like, right on, like, a, on a line. That, to me, makes, makes sense. Um, okay, so, pull out the calculator. Love the calculator. Um, 1.25 divided by 2 pi. <laughs> okay, squared divided by 0 0.05 equals that, and then to the minus 1, okay? That's going to get me um, 1.26. And then, do you guys remember what, like, what, what are the units for K? Oh, and wait, wait, did I do this right? Oh, it's 0.5, not 0.05. I fucked up. Yeah, 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 no, no. I, I did something wrong. I did, I did, uh, I did the, the calculation wrong with the... I used 0.05 for my mass. It should have been 0.5. So here, we can redo that. We do that divided by point. That's where the 10 comes from. <laughs> to the negative one. You're right. There you go. 12.6. Yeah, good. So this is 12.6. Um, was it newtons over meters? Good. Awesome. It says at time equals 0.75 seconds, the object spring system has a total kinetic energy. And okay, okay. At 1.13 seconds. Earth, again, has a blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, energy's conserved. Love that. Um, what, are, what are they asking? They're saying, explain how a feature in the graph indicates that total kinetic energy in this system is the same... How a feature? Same as... Okay. Uh, what, 0.75, which is, like, right here? And then they said 1.26. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, the total kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> this is cool. So let's remember that the velocity is equal to like dx dt, okay? So if I look, so that's the slope 
of the height versus time graph, right? That's how we get the velocity, okay? Notice how the slope here is the same as the slope here. It's just opposite in sign. It's like positive versus negative because they're at the same point on the sign, sign graph, right? This is to the right here, to the right here. The, these are going to have the same slope, but they're opposite in terms of positive and negative. But we have V squared. So that's going to that's gonna flip it. Uh, oh, that's not going to flip it, sorry. That's, that's going to make the negative positive and it's going to keep the positive positive. So that's, that's how you see that the kinetic energy of, of the two is the same. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. It's the slope because the slope is the velocity. Cool. Briefly explain why the total potential energy is the same at these two lines as well. Okay. Um, right. Potential energy uh, equal to one half kx squared. Hmm. Plus MGH. Oh, okay, okay, I see. But kinetic energy plus potential energy, right, at like time one, has to equal KE plus PE at time two, right? Total energy has to be conserved before and after, right? Both, both, at, both at this, yes, good. They love the conservation. <laughs> they love it. Both here and here, you have to have the same total energy. Good. So, because the kinetic energy we already showed was the same here, okay, that means that the potential energies at both time points also have to be the same. So, let's see. What do they say? They, if the total energy of the system is constant, so K is the same at both times, you must also be. Yes. Correct. So, total energy, right, is kinetic plus potential. Since the kinetic is the same at both time points, that means the potential must also be the same at both Nice. Okay, cool. That's another one done. Awesome. My mouse. My mouse. Oh, not bad. Okay, the experiment is repeated with a spring constant of 4K0 as the same length as the original is hung from a new spring allowed to come rest at new equilibrium. Determine the new equilibrium position. Oh, this is cool. I like this. Um, so the old equilibrium was equal to 1. Okay, so this thing starts, right, at some initial height and then eventually ends up pulling down due to having some mass, right, pulling down on it. And what we know about the stretching, right, is that the force of the spring pulling it up has to equal the force of the mass pulling it down. So we say that K naught times X has to equal um, Mg. Okay. Now what happens is, and this mg is always going to be constant, right? So in this case, now they say um, that we're using 4k naught. Like we have four times the spring constant. Okay. Equals mg. Mg is the same. So if this goes up by a factor of four, this must go down by a factor of four. Okay. So instead of the thing falling down however much it falls down it's going to it's only going to fall down a quarter of that amount now did we get a k from this did we get a k we did right what do we get we got that k was equal to 12.6 okay because this this is this is the key thing here so this is going to be some amount of stretch right delta x and then we're going to have in the new spring this is going to end up stretching only uh, a quarter of delta x, okay? So, I need to figure out what this difference in the distance is, okay? So, k delta x, right, is equal to mg. In that case, 12.6 times delta x is equal to 9.8 times g. Oh, sorry, sorry. 9.8 times the mass, 0.5. So that's going to be 4.9 over 12.6. Calculate R. So we have 4.9 divided by 
12.6, that's point point three eight nine meters. Okay, that's how that's how far this drops. Point three eight nine. But I knew with my I know with my new spring, which is four times stiffer, it's only going to drop a quarter of that. Okay, so we're going to divide that by four, and so that's going to drop. Um, so in the full case, right, it was point three eight nine. Now it's only going to drop point oh nine seven. Okay. But this thing is measuring from the ground. It measures a meter, okay? So the new distance that this thing measures is going to be like this amount. See how it's, it's this minus this? Because that's like the, that's the new height. It's like the height of it because it's, it doesn't drop down as much. Um, so if we do, what is it? This minus this, that gets, ends up uh, getting us 0.292. So it's going to read the one meter plus an additional 0.292. So this should end up being uh, 1.292, I believe. Uh... Wait, wait. The experiment with a spring has the same length. They said it's point nine. What? Point nine. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, 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 okay. Motion records the height of the bottom hanger. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I see. The one meter is it not having the mass on it. Ah. Oh, this is tricky. I see. I see. Okay. I see. I see. Then they place the mass on it. I read this as this was the mass. And then, like, we started stretching things. Okay. All right. All right. Um, okay. You're still going to have a quarter of, of, of the equilibrium distance. So... When this was, um, let's see, the height is 60. Okay. This is the equilibrium height. Right, good. Equilibrium height is 60 centimeters. They're saying this is 0.6. Okay. Um, which means that, what was this? 0.4. How much it dropped? Okay. With the mass on it? Okay. And it, and it should only drop, it should drop a quarter of that now. So it should just drop point, drop point one. So it should have an equal position of point seven. Why do they say it's point nine? Where does that come from? One sec, I'm gonna get this. Tricky, tricky college board. Always the springs. Always the springs. Yeah, point six is is so yeah. Once once the mass is attached to it, right? We say that this is point six, okay, and that's with like a value of k. If we increase k to like four times it, right? The amount that this dropped should be a quarter of it because kx um, is equal to mg. Mg does not change. K goes up by four. X needs to go down by four. So if it if it stretched, oh, 0. 0.6 plus 0. 0.292. Oh. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying.
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, Alexandra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Oh, because they're, they're putting the rounding on this. Oh, okay. So I was right to start with, right? Yeah, okay. This is a meter, right? It drops 0.4. That's why... Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why it reads it as 60, because this is 1 minus point basically two nine. It's minus one minus wait wait it was one minus point three eight nine. Right, so that's one minus point four. That's the point six. But now we're only dropping point oh nine seven. Okay, that's why it's point nine. Okay, cool. All right, sorry. Oh man. Yeah after an hour and fifty minutes my brain sometimes starts to like <laughs> miss like obvious things. Yes. Okay. New equilibrium position is point nine meters. Great. The object is pulled down same distance d not from the equilibrium position and, re and released. Draw a curve. Okay, so this is going to be 0.9. Great. Um, is the period going to change? I think it does. Yeah, right? Is t is equal to 2 pi square root of uh, m over k? Right? Okay. So if k goes up by a factor of 4, now the period needs to drop by a factor of 2 is what happens, okay? So now instead of this hitting this at 1.25, it needs to hit it at like 0.6, okay? Um, the amplitude though is not gonna change, okay? Uh, so the amplitude of the oscillation does not depend on K. It is more frequent, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see, it's gonna be, it, we're still gonna pull it by the same D naught, so we're still gonna pull it down by five centimeters. So this is whatever 90 this is still this is gonna be 85 and then this is gonna be 95 um but now it's gonna hit that minimum again at half of 1.25 so it's gonna hit it at 0.6 so it's like like this not graded scratch work oh that's nice they give you like a whole thing for it okay cool Label the vertical axis. Okay, I think that's fine. Is that what I get? Yes, that's what they get. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the, the main thing you need to plot here, you need to make sure that you plot that the period is now a quarter of, uh, sorry, a half of what it used to be. So this needs to be 0.675 times in seconds. The new equilibrium position needs to be 90, and you need to show that the amplitude is the same. It's still 5 centimeters. Wow. Okay, cool. Is that, is that all for this question? But all for the... Oh, it's all for the whole exam. Oh, nice. Ooh. Oh, wow. Okay. I think that almost takes the record for longest stream. What are we at? Hour 47? Nah, I've done, I've done two or three. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Awesome. Was that helpful, Alexandria? Did, was that helpful to go through that? I, you know, I, I, I hope that you guys can see, like, kind of my strategies, like, stuff with, with how I do it. <laughs> Honestly, so helpful. Sick. I love that. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right, awesome. I think, yeah, so let's, it's, I have, I have a rule also when I, like, I teach students and whatnot, is that, like, you're not going to learn anything after two hours. <laughs> I have, because I, I teach privately as well, and sometimes students will have exams the next day, and they're like, oh, I want to book you, Dr. Gold, for four hours. I'm like, bro, you're not going to learn anything after two. So, <laughs> I don't even let them, like, book me for more than two hours. So, we're almost at two hours. I hope this was helpful and whatnot. Tomorrow's stream, um, what I can do is let me go through all, like, the tricky concepts that, that questions that you guys have. So Alexandra, I I I would love to do some. I'll do some some problems with the um, you know the the two masses on like side by side or the masses on top of each other. This is always a super confusing one, uh, in terms of friction and whatnot. And they could ask it. So yeah, if if you're gonna be around for tomorrow's stream, let me let me do that. Any any unit six practice would be great tomorrow. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So here's a great thing, Alexandra. If you have um. If you have example problems from Unit 6 and whatnot, you can always post those. Um, try posting it in, 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 the, in the Discord forum we have. You can also DM them to me if you want. Um, yeah, because the, 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 
the exact types of questions you have usually helps. I have a general idea of like what you're going to go through, but if you have example questions of like ones that like confused you, that'll be the best way for me to help you. Um, but yeah. Or even if you have something, it doesn't have to be the exact question. If you've already done the question, just so I can see what it looks like, I can come up with something that's similar. Okay, awesome, cool. Yeah, that would be great, Alexander. Sweet. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this uh, special edition of Office Hours, AP Physics 1. We'll be streaming again tomorrow, same time, 2 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Central, 5 o'clock Eastern. Yes, you're very welcome, Alexander. Of course. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate having you guys here and whatnot. Thanks. We had 90 viewers on TikTok. That's awesome. Cool. Um, we had like four or five max on, on Twitch, a bunch of the Discord. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to help you guys out. And again, if, if, if you want to go through practice questions, check out the Kudu stuff we got. Um, I spent a lot of time putting that course together. So, you know, take advantage of it. And otherwise, we will see you uh, tomorrow, same time. Good luck with everything. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday, and we'll, uh, we'll hit it tomorrow. Peace.